many of our subscribers don't see our videos, make sure that you click the notification bell. And if you haven't already, follow us on social media for tips, tutorials, giveaways, and daily inspiration. Helping, because I feel like a lot of people kind of struggle with cooking at home and sure. see it as a big task that sure. they, like, they kind of don't look forward to. And a lot of people probably get bored and they feel like it's too much money, so they just yeah. want to get like the frozen meals and stuff yeah. like that. So kind of helping people find a little bit of new perception. And yeah, yeah. Ways well, it's it's that. it's interesting because I kind of feel like if you take a step back, you kind of look at our culture today and, you know, um, it, it makes me think of like the Jetsons and stuff, you know, yeah. where you just put everything in a box and boom, it comes out and it's ready to go. Right. So kind of the the skill of cooking is almost a lost craft, which I think is also why um, this whole idea of being the celebrity chef it has has really gained so much traction because maybe t 10 years ago I was like okay the guy can cook big deal so can everyone else right mm -hmm. but now it's so much of um um you know it's so it, it's like i said it's something that not everyone can do it's kind of a lost art mm -hmm. that and and especially now that with with cooking becoming you know nouveau cuisine kind of going in this this direction of very much of an of people considered an art form and it's being much more received as an art form yeah that yeah you're you, that kind of that all just kind of fills into this real weird realm we're in where cool is food is really cool but everyone has but yet on a day-to-day -day life we all struggle with it you know mm -hmm. i mean i'm a chef and i struggle with cooking and feeding my family right because <clears throat> Life is busy. Yeah. I, I don't have nearly the struggles as many families that I cook for do. I just have one four year old and you know, my wife and I both we we both own our own companies, but it still is um it's a struggle. And so there's a lot of things. I'm fortunate that since my company does weekly meals that um I I actually have my own weekly meal surface, yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, in fact, it's kind of a funny joke that at cocktail parties when, you know, um, we meet people and and my wife tells her people that um, she's married to a chef, you know, she gets the, whole, oh, you must be so lucky. You're, uh, you know, you're married to a chef. You must cook for you every night. And she's like, well... So about that, you know, <laughs> she's like, she's like, so he owns the company and he's so busy doing things like every other business owner. But yeah, his, his chefs that work for him, they cook for me every day. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, um, and, and it's, I think just because lives are so busy today. And so you kind of see, which is kind of the impetus of my whole business with our weekly meals is that um, you do have the, you know, just being able to give people that time back to spend with their family and, and, to, and, and to do other things as opposed to just kind of slogging in the kitchen and getting things done. So, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's, it, it the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. And so, Kind of like you were saying that that was going to be one of my questions. One of my first questions mm -hmm. is like being a chef, going from like if you if you're a chef and you're cooking all day, yeah, at, at work, and then you go home. Uh huh. Like a lot of people are probably thinking like, oh, awesome, I'm married to a chef, I'm gonna right. get so many good meals. But right. like, it's got to be the last thing you want to do. And you you're absolutely home. right. Yeah, you know, it's kind of the old moniker of you know the cobbler's kid who has no shoes, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's um, it, it's it, and I'm sure that that's kind of. You know, the last thing an accountant wants to do is go home and balance their checkbook, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's still the same thing. Um, what I have found is that as is that as my company grows and as my position in the company kind of goes to more of just leading the company mm -hmm. and not doing the day-to-day -day cooking, I do still – I'm now finding myself going back and just cooking for the love of it and cooking for um, just what it means to me to share that craft with my friends and family. Um, but, yeah, it's still um, – it's – for my family, it's still a challenge. Um, and – and so, yeah, it's we I try to kind of keep things fun and fresh in the house. But, yeah, it, it sometimes you're just like, OK, I, you know, let's just order a pizza. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I know that's always just like the go to. Yeah. Well, and I remember when I was in culinary school, I, one of the things that just blew me away was that when I was in culinary school, one of my chef instructors told me about how, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but he told me how he just loved the dollar menu at the at the drive-through, and I just mm -hmm. I, 
And this this chef had a very very impressive resume where he had worked in different restaurants and and I didn't get it at the time. I was like, you you have this ability to do all these go- to cook all these great things, but yet you know you're you're eating kind of the bottom of the barrel of, of food. Like why would you do that? But now I get it. I, not that I do fast food a lot, but I get that you know no matter what you do is it's it's um you know you don't want to take it home with you right, right. um. And it, which is interesting because I also get a lot of, um, I'll run into people along the way that say, "Oh man, I love cooking. I've thought about becoming a chef." <clears throat> and I think most of the time, the first thing I tell them is, "Don't do it." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, don't do it because um, the difference between leisurely cooking on a Saturday afternoon with a glass of wine and some music going in your air conditioned kitchen and kind of being able to do it at your leisure while, you know there's a movie on, you know, whatever, like yeah. all of the comforts of home being able to do that versus, um, you know, being in a hot kitchen for 12 to 14 hours a day on your feet, you know, in a commercial kitchen. Um, it's a stark difference and it'll, it'll kind of skew your perspective. It'll kind of oh, ruin yeah. it for you. you uh, know? Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Cause I know the hours of being chefs is often <clears throat> pretty, pretty crazy, isn't it? It's, it's the wild, wild west yeah. for sure. I mean, we, you know, we, um, there's kind of jokes in the kitchen about, you know, what's a break, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to, I think cause supposedly the government wants you to take a break every four hours and have a lunch break. And it's like, you know, most cooks, you know, if they're scheduled for eight hours, they're going to plan on being at work for about 10 or 12, yes. you know, and, and, you know, we used to, I, when I was when I was cooking in restaurants, I didn't smoke cigarettes, mm-hmm. but I used to always get jealous of the guys that did yeah, because they could break. go and run out and take a quick smoke break, and I'd be like, you know, hey chef, can I no? Can I take a break? No, keep going. You know? Yeah. So, but um, but yeah, it's you know, um, I think that it, it's, I think that there's kind of what we find, and and for me is that. The value of food today, I think, has also kind of shifted in mm-hmm. our culture, right? Um, and to talk about that dollar menu, going back to that, is that, you know, I've, in my business, what I do is I find that um, it kind of feels like we need to kind of get back to a point where we value food again, good, wholesome, whole food, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the dollar menu has kind of convinced us all that for a buck, you can eat you can eat a hamburger and that that's healthy and that's, le- and that's actually food, right? Where we kind of look back at that and we go, well, how, what's the nutritional value of that? You know? Yeah. So, so there's always that component of it. Um, you know, I think that cooking historically in kind of the nucleus of families has always been something that's brought people together. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's always that component of it as well, as far as breaking bread with fem- family and friends that I think, um, you know, could probably help our society in any society, right. Maintaining that kind of keeping that, that nucleus. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because that's something that I feel like has been lost pretty significantly in the last, you know, sure. 10, 20 years, sure. especially with technology like cell phones and like a lot of families having a, a television, yeah. you know, right next to the yep. right next to the dinner table yeah. or all of these different things. Yeah. People get busier, so a lot of people might not even be home for their dinner time because it used to be a very communal time yeah. where everyone kind of gets together and you get to actually connect sure. with your family and friends or whatever. Sure. Um, and now, yeah, it's, it's kind of harder to do that. So I feel like just from that stance alone mm-hmm. of like getting that connection with your family yeah. or even when you go out with your friends, you'll still see a lot of groups of friends go out, but they're still like on their phones. Yeah. Isn't that weird? You know, right? you're going to go like, spend a hundred dollars at a yeah. really nice restaurant, but you're going to, yeah. And, and a great glass of wine and everyone's got their face in their phone. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's busy, like yeah. taking a picture of the food and right. the wine and yeah. posting it so that yep. everybody can see that they're yep. having fun, but yep. they're not really enjoying present. the actual. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's a very interesting thing to me yeah. that I think is like really important for people yeah. to kind of get back to. Yeah. You know? Well, it's it's interesting because I mean, I see this in my business, but um I also kind of see it just in general is <clears throat> um you know, my family it's kind of a big deal that that dinner is kind of a no technology zone, mm-hmm. right? It's and it's tough being my wife and I both are self-employed. We own our businesses and, you know, everything. I mean, if I don't have a cell phone or a laptop on me, I, I can't run my business. Um and it's tough to kind of put that away, right. And be present for each other and for our daughter. 
um, and, you know, turn the TV off. So it's a challenge, I think, to kind of block out the noise and kind of be present, as mm-hmm. we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think what I'm finding, too, is that what a, lo- a good habit that I think a lot of families are doing today is that they're, and I think that's why you're seeing this big explosion of kind of the weekly meal kits, the meal services, chefs like me, um, kind of coming on the scene and essentially kind of taking over the the cooking for the families is because since since there's such a finite amount of time these days and lives you know life just goes so quickly mm-hmm. that parents want to and families want to they want to monopolize that amount of time as best they can and so you know mom mom thinks or dad thinks well you know if it's going to take me an hour to cook dinner i would rather Either do a bunch of meal prep on Sunday, mm-hmm. Rich. We can talk about that because I know something you want to talk about is kind of how to expedite that kind of stuff. So I can like batch prep for the week, or um, I can have someone else do it for me. Mm-hmm. Right now, in the past, and even even today, as you still have, you know, not only do you have, you know, there's a lot of ways to solve that problem now, right? Because you'll have. You can do your own meal prep. You can hire someone like us, a chef to come in or even to cook and do meals for you. But then you even have the ease of technology of things like Uber Eats, right? right? And Postmates. And so you can now you can bring the restaurant food to you. So um, I, I feel like there, there's still a gravitational pull there for the families to kind of um, draw lines around this time and say, this is important, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think in our... With the, you know, whatever you want to say about families and fractures and things in tonight, today's society, I think that that kind of thing can always bring us always back together, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which is why I was thinking about things like Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving and Easter and those, whether you, whether you celebrate those for whatever reason, but even Thanksgiving just from the sense of everyone's going to come together, you're going to cook your favorite, you know, most gluttonous dish, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, how, how, how better to work to ruin green beans than to just cover it in gravy. Right. right. <laughs> but it's still delicious and it still gives us a chance to kind of get together. And I think for me is that that's kind of what food has always meant to me is that <clears throat> it's always been, and, and, I, and this is kind of what has kind of, what kind of fuels me and kind of creates the vision for my company is food's always been more of an emotional thing and it always has has kind of memories tied around it mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um i mean we all can sit here and we can all think of um a specific dish or a specific recipe that even if you hear the words like when i start talking about hatch green chilies i immediately think about going and spending the summers and um, you know, visiting my family in El Paso mm-hmm. because we drive up the road to Hatch, New Mexico. And we buy the chilies and bring them back, right? And this was this was before Hatch Green chilies were a big thing, right? right. It's just pretty much everyone in like New Mexico and El Paso kind of knew about it. Um, and so even to this day, like, you know, I'm the guy that goes to Central Market and buys a hundred pounds, literally, of Hatch Green chilies and stockpiles them and eats them throughout the year, All year be- long. because yeah, because you you know otherwise you get them in a can. It's just not the same. Not the same. It's not the same. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's always. I think that food and eating and breaking bread, like it's through our throughout the history of man, has always been something that's kind of brought us together. Um, and, and always kind of had a meaning behind it. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree 100%. And so it, that's kind of like an interesting thing with nowadays, especially like you, you're married to obviously like a very holistic health mm-hmm. yes. practitioner yes. where like obviously nutrition is such yes. a, a big part of for sure. her life and yeah, uh, your sure. whole family's life. Yeah, for sure. And that whole nutritional world is like getting a lot bigger now where you have different diets that come out that people yeah. will try and do and people have yeah. a lot more kind of dietary restrictions that they're yeah, trying to sure. focus on right and so I, but I, I do feel like it's important not to go too far over where like you're almost hating food not hating but it, it, it takes away all that joy because I think I there's agree. so much you know what I mean yeah, there's so yeah. much benefit from the social aspect yeah. enjoying that yeah. time that I feel like if you go so far over to where food is just for like I just want to eat for energy yeah. and like yeah. sustenance or whatever. Right. Right. It's like I, I do feel like you lose a lot out. So I do. Yeah. I, I think it's a really important balance that 
it's almost gone like overdrive on the nutritional side. Yeah, there's a couple things, you know, there's, yeah, there's a couple things I see there that it's funny. Tanisha and I have these conversations a lot um, about nutrition and about kind of alternate nutrition, if that's a word. But I guess a good example of that is, for example, um, gluten free bread. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of had this, my wife and I've kind of bantered back and forth on this concept of gluten free bread. My thought has always been either, you are or you're not like either either you're glu- you want to eat gluten free and gluten free um, um, just doesn't agree. Gluten doesn't agree that you're going to go that lifestyle or you're not. But I've always wondered, I've always like you if you turn over the back of a pack of gluten free bread, you're like, OK, I'm not getting gluten. But now I'm getting all these other multi-syllable chemical, you know, mm-hmm. so it's almost like, are you just jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire? Right. You know, um, I see that a lot with a lot of with a lot of kind of these dietary restrictions. Yeah, a lot of like um, the vegan meat. Yeah, exactly, know? right. And that's yeah, exactly. And it's funny I have I have some friends of mine that are vegan and some of them some of them are like, yeah, you know, we just, you know, it doesn't make sense because I'm I'm vegan for a variety of reasons, mm-hmm. one of them being health, and it just doesn't make sense that if I don't want to eat meat because of the the health aspects of it but yet i go over here and i eat this kind of weird processed yeah you know extract of something and then you try and make it look like a hamburger and it's like well you know if i choose to not eat meat then i'm saying yeah hamburgers aren't for me <laughs> you know like yeah. i don't under i so i get that and and especially in that world um so i've always kind of been a question you know, and the other one is like dairy free and so um we have a four-year-old and so there's the natural desire to want to have something like macaroni and cheese in oh, the house. Yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah. And so um we always kind of have this com- we always always kind of have this this tug and this push and pull between my wife and I of well why don't I just make her some good quality ham- macaroni and cheese, right? Mm-hmm. Get a nice good whole wheat pasta, make, you know, a cheese sauce the way it's supposed to be made. Yes, it's going to have gluten in it, but it's going to be made from good quality cheese. Right. Not like It's not like Velveeta. Yeah, or not like Velveeta or or craft. like yeah, 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 <laughs> or like the dairy-free Daya stuff from mm-hmm. like okay, somehow they made a vegetable look and taste like cheese. That's how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know that's that's just kind of weird to me. So yeah, it, it's interesting to see kind of all of that. Um and you know, it's all I I with our with what I do, I do see a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of dietary protocols that are coming out today. Um, and I, you know it's funny because at the end of the day, it just kind of seems like to me that the takeaway from it all is, you know, uh, moderation, mm-hmm. right? Balance and just being mindful of serving sizes. I mm-hmm. think that's always kind of been the things, right? Um, I think American, the American, the Western diet, if you were, is typically, you know, the, the the big red flags are serving sizes and then whole foods, right? Yeah. Whole foods, not um, the processed pieces or stuff like that. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so for like for families that are that are trying to move away from kind of relying on the heavily yeah. processed stuff yeah. like the frozen meals or yeah. constantly eating fast food or all these kind of different things. Yeah. Obviously, uh, like uh, the first thing you gotta do is start with how you're shopping in the grocery store, if that's absolutely. the right you're going, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so when you go shopping in the grocery store, like what are there are there big red flags of things you would say when you're going shopping for stuff that yeah. maybe people like kind of like common traps that people fall sure. into and that kind of things. Yeah. So you know, there's an old saying. I I didn't make it up, so I won't take credit <laughs> for it. But um, there was an old saying that says, "Shop on the outside of the mm-hmm. grocery store," right? Um, when you start walking down the aisles, things that are shelf stable that aren't that, you know, are typically something that's been processed because, um, you know, if you think about it, fruits, vegetables and meat, all of those things have a shelf life and they need to be refrigerated for preservation. So if you start walking down the aisles, you're kind of you're, you're, you're going into a realm where things have had to be something has to be added to them or there's something in the process that has to keep them so that they can sit on the shelf for a substantial amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a big trap. Um, I think another one is, um, is when you are looking at things is, um, you know, sugars, sugar and salt, even in those refrigerated items, 
Um, they're two components that are natural, exi natural existing elements, but they can be, and they are, and can be used for preserving things. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, I'm again. This isn't a, this isn't my own unique thought. It's it's definitely something very prevalent right now about sugar and its impact in our diet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And so that's always a red flag, especially as a parent. I mean, I'm I'm I read labels today. I've read more labels in the last four years than I probably have in the last forty plus years that I've been alive, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I try to be so much more mindful about what I'm giving my daughter, um, because what I know from a chef is that your palate tends to crave things, right? Your palate kind of drives that that craving for things, and so. I want her to crave things like apples and spinach and broccoli, which mm -hmm. those are hard right now, yeah. by the way. So, <laughs> you know, a shout out to all the parents who are having those issues. I'm a chef, I, you know, and my four year old right now is like, if it's green, it's yuck. <laughs> yeah. So the struggle is real. We're all dealing with it. It's, it's not just, you know, it's not just, um, it's not just you, right? All parents have that issue um, with their kids, but yeah, so it's, you know, I think that that's kind of a, I think that's when you're looking at a lot of things, being mindful of what's in it. Um, with it, when it comes to meats is, um, you know, I, I kind of, I, when it comes to fish, I try to stay, I try to make sure I'm getting at least wild caught. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big fan of farm raised. If we kind of look at what farm raised fish are being fed, traditionally, it's not something that, you know, especially with things like salmon and stuff like that. Um, salmon's a big one that's farm raised. I would much rather, as a chef, when I'm cooking for my clients or I'm cooking for my family, I would rather buy a previously frozen, wild caught piece of seafood hmm. over fresh farm raised. Interesting. I'm gonna, I'm willing to sacrifice the probably degradation in texture, right? Because frozen fish at times, and if you get a bag of like wild caught salmon at Costco, it's gonna take taste texturally distinctly different than the fresh salmon that they have in the case. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, the fresh salmon is going to be farm-raised. Right. So from just a texture standpoint, they're going to be different. But from from just a nutritional value, you're going to get more out of that out of that wild caught, right? Mm -hmm. So that's always kind of been a rule that I've always lived by. Um, uh, red meat, chicken, poultry, stuff like that. Um, you know, I'd like to say that we always buy organic. But um, I do for my clients, we will buy organic for them and antibiotic and hormone free are kind of the bare minimum. We always mm -hmm. make sure antibiotic and hormone free are bare minimum there. Um, in, so those are kind of some of the things that I look for. Um, yeah. Those are the main ones. Yeah. yeah the it's main interesting ones. about the, cause you're talking about buying the, the frozen fish if it's wild caught, yeah. which is like, that's an interesting thing because I've also heard, um, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but they were talking about fruit and they said that actually buying, you can buy organic frozen fruit. Mm, mm -hmm. And they say that that's actually like, it, it has more of a nutritional, like, value. Yeah, more nutritional value because they, it's freshly, it's like right yeah. off the pick, then yeah. they freeze it immediately. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when you get it in the, you know, in the fruit section at your, in the produce at, sure. at your um, at your grocery store, they've had to prematurely pick it because they know it's going to take time to to get to the grocery store and be ready. That makes sense. So that that was kind of that's an interesting thing. That makes sense. I know that um, I learned very early on in my culinary career. One of my chef instructors always told me. He said, "When it comes to bananas, always buy organic." Really? He's, yeah. He said because here's what happens when they buy when you. When you get an unorganic banana, what happens is is they pick it green, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then they stick them in bags, and then they spray them an air in this bag that does two things: it expedites ripening and it kills off any insect any insects that are in that are on the, the right, fruit. Right, right. And then it sits essentially in that bag for weeks as it's being transported over wow. here. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, that's one. And and he said. You know, and, and so someone obviously raised their hand and like, well, you're not eating the the banana peel, right? Mm -hmm. And the argument behind that is, well, yeah, but it's still a living thing, you know. Yeah. It's still gonna take things from the exterior and Yeah, it's not like know, a bulletproof vest. Right, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's especially hard to, these tiny air like air is yeah, gonna for sure. You, you gotta figure those cells will, are still transmit yeah, are still yeah. transferring things amongst them because you know, uh, you got to think the banana is still air quotes growing, yep. right? Because it's still ripening. So there's still chemical reactions that are happening. The, yep. the cells are still maturing on that banana. Mm -hmm. 
um, not to get all scientific for no, me, no, right? it's good. <laughs> well, I'm, I like science. I, well, I'm I'm a chef, not a, not a scientist, so we kind of reach the depth of my science <laughs> right there. You know, that and osmosis, and I'm, I'm, I'm that's about yeah, it. I'm, I'm kind of about yeah, I'm, I've kind of reached my limit, but yeah. um, but yeah, so that that was always one. Th- so that's always a rule, um, you know. There's there's the dirty dozen out there, which is which is always a good rule to live by as far as if you're not sure what to buy organic. Yeah. I know. And so those are good. Um, <clears throat> is that like is that, that that's basically the 12 foods that you most want to get organic? Yeah. Yeah. Right? They're the tw- well, it's the 12 foods that I think are most likely to have the most pesticides, like pesticides on, on them. Right. Okay. I think it's like berries. It was a lot of fruits. Yeah berries and apples and things like that. I have to go back and look. Re- really kind of the rule of thumb in my business is if it's available organic, that's what we're going with. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then another thing I think that, that a lot of people do, because in the when you're buying like vegetables, yeah, um, a lot of places have the option to buy these kind of pre, they're not pre-made vegetables, but like like greens that are pre-cut and mm-hmm, packaged in mm-hmm, the, these mm-hmm. plastic bins yep. and same with like different broccolis and things yeah. like that. And so a lot of people buy those, but I've found those tend to go bad quicker. Well, it certainly, especially because if you think about it is, um, you know, take a take a crown of broccoli, for example, mm-hmm. right? Um, you There's really only one spot that air is getting into that broccoli where it's not supposed to. It's the cut at the bottom, mm-hmm. right? Versus if you start cutting off all the little individual florets, um, now you're kind of opening each one, each it, more surface area is now right, open right. to oxygen, which it typically wouldn't be. So yeah, it's going to, it's going to slow that down. Um, I'm sure that somewhere along the way that also there, um, that, you know, if you have crown broccoli, crown a and crown B crown A is going to go straight onto the shelf. Right. And mm-hmm. so it's shelf life, but the other one crown B is going to take another week of being processed and then putting a container and then going on the shelf. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, if you're, if you're comparing a, you know, a piece of broccoli that's sitting on the shelf, it's probably a week. Um, it's probably, you know, not, it hasn't been on the shelf as long right. as that process. That stuff. makes sense. And I've found that too. And, um, I think a lot of things, um, you know, it depends upon how quickly you go through things. Um, I like to buy, uh, peeled be- peeled garlic. Mm-hmm. I like to buy peeled garlic because uh, we go through so much garlic that it's it's really a hassle to kind of peel it all the time. Yeah. But we go through a lot of it, right? And mm-hmm. with garlic is if you start if it starts kind of looking like it's turning, you can do a lot of things with it. You know, you can throw it in some oil, throw it in the oven, and roast it. And now you have kind of nice roasted garlic, and it'll hold for another week or two. But now you have a really cool garlic infused oil that you can use as well oh, yeah. so you know you can get there's some t- tips and tricks along the way with especially with kind of utilizing produce and, and vegetables um, to kind of when you see them starting to turn a little bit what you can do uh, but in general yeah getting you know getting a whole head of lettuce it's going to last longer than the stuff that's shredded yeah. in the container um, and you know i prefer like when it comes to just your red red leaf and green leaf lettuce i prefer to get it in the big Mm-hmm. heads mm-hmm. um because you can peel back and get those really nice tender greens in the middle oh, yeah. that make for really nice salads and stuff not just and you don't even have to cut those up you pull those outer layers out you know you'll want to run a knife through those but those little kind of the hearts in the middle those are really nice and tender and you can just throw those right on top of salad oh nice yeah yeah, yeah. and then so again kind of like uh, not every grocery store is going to have it, but a lot of most grocery stores now have the like the fresh bakeries right where yep. they where they do actually cook fresh bread sure. right sure and i feel like that's also probably a much that's a much better option than buying the bread that's going to be located in the center of the supermarket i would assume wouldn't it because yeah you know I, I don't know so bread i mean in our house we don't eat a lot of bread right. you know yeah, bread's uh, we um but i when i'm buying bread for a client or something like that we'll typically go to the bakery a it's a little bit more of an artisan yeah right um, you're not going to get a lot of the really good rise and so, especially like if I go to like central market or whole foods and their bakeries are having really, some really nice, cool kind of artisan breads. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, for little Joe's peanut butter and jellies on a Tuesday, you know, the, the loaf stuff is probably just fine. Maybe, yeah. a, but then you're getting the point now where I've seen that, um, they're having some really good, almost. Uh, packaged artisan breads. Like, yeah, there was one that I saw the other day that had like a bunch of nuts and and grains and stuff in it. And 
I'm kind of weird where if I eat my bread, I want it like I want it full of a bunch of stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? Like yeah. I want the oats and and some pecans or something in it. You know, I almost want to like my my bread almost needs to have to have like nuts and things. Oh in yeah, it, you I know like what I mean. That. So so yeah, I kind of I'm not really a big white bread. No, you know, fan, I don't like white so, bread at all. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, they bleach it, right? That's what I've always heard. I've heard they like bleach. There's a lot of different processes it. they use with flour, um, which you know, when you look at when you look at flours that are processed or that are kind of made in the U.S. versus Europe, um, a good friend of mine, she's a chef, and her husband is celiac, okay. and so I mean, he has such a bad gluten allergy that if he go, he can't even walk into a bakery because the really the, like yeah he'll like yeah he'll start he'll he'll or... he'll start feeling itchy and kind of having reactions wow. just from the just from the flour in the air. They went to Italy over the summer, and he was able to eat bread. See, yeah, that's fascinating. I've heard that. Mm-hmm. I've heard that the bread and flour and everything mm-hmm. over there is completely different than American. It's just not. Well, it's 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 what they've. It's the process of milling the bread, mm-hmm. or milling the grains the, into flour, um, and it's also I think just the base grain that they're using. Um, there's a restaurant here in Austin, Emmer and Rye, that um, mills their own. Oh, cool. They mill their own flour, and so I've had a few. Have you, I've had a few friends that are that are gluten free that have gone in there, and they do. All, they make all their own pastas. They make all their own bread from that flour, and they swear up and down that they don't get the reactions that they do from typical stuff. So I think it's that it's and they're using heirloom, you know, heirloom grains, and they're hand milling everything, and so yeah, they're not bleaching it. They're not. Um, processing right. it so much right that's so, interesting that is really fascinating yeah that you can essentially think of someone to be a celiac or like yeah. not able to eat gluten but then yeah that's really interesting yeah well it's funny i think one of the biggest misconceptions that i have to educate a lot of my clients on is that um corn is not a vegetable yeah yeah so what is corn corn is a grain Corn is a grain. Corn is that a grain. That makes sense i guess mm-hmm. yeah, corn yeah if you think about think about i mean the problem is is that we've we've Corn grows on a cob, mm-hmm. and there's times a year where we'll eat it and we'll cook it like it's a vegetable. But no, it's strictly a grain. And if you kind of open it up, it it's a seed, right? It's a grain. It, you if you take a kernel of corn off of a off of a cob that's uh, not been cooked, obviously, mm-hmm. you can go plant it in the ground and it will grow it's another piece on. of corn. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's that's true. I guess I never even think about yeah, that. Yeah, so I've had a lot of clients that say, "Oh, you know, I want to go grain free." And okay, great, cool. So we'll start going along, and then like, wow, you know, I'd really love to have some corn. You have to remind him. So you remember we talked about you going grain free. Oh, I didn't realize that, you know. Yeah. So that's always uh it's always um I think one that's a big misconception, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um and so 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 when it comes to your you know, you're making your plan for the mm-hmm. week, ideally you want to go into the grocery store with like a list because yeah. once you get in there and I know they always also say like oh, don't heck, go to the grocery store. Or never go to look. Oh man, I've done that. that. I'm a chef. I've done it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's disaster. Then it's just you want everything. Yep. So like you, I think you going overbuy. with that plan. Yeah, mm-hmm. going with that plan so you have it kind yeah. of a, a game plan. You know what you're going to make for sure. like the week, so that you're prepared is always good. Um, so when it comes to people making their making their food, yeah. whatever it's going to be, you. Some people are probably scared they're going to get like a little bit bored. A lot of people are just using like salt and pepper. Yeah. You know, which is I love salt and pepper. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things. But are are there like are there some kind of key spices or things that you can use, sure. herbs or something like that that like people like let's say like a few that they would should always basically have in their pantry that can always kind yeah. of be used across. So what I like is um, you know, and to kind of stage this is so I'm a classically French trained chef, but I cook my if kind of left to my own devices i do kind of modern american Mm -hmm. um i only say that because in my kitchen at home um i always have fresh thyme and fresh rosemary garlic onions um carrots celery so carrots celery and onions are kind of and garlic are in the french world are called mirepoix which is essentially your base vegetable that pretty much almost everything starts from okay and so when you're looking at you know things to add flavor and depth is is it you know chefs we learn to kind of layer flavors and um for the home cook easy way to do that is is like i said is um, you can get fresh thyme and fresh rosemary at the grocery store. And believe it or not, if you put it in a glass of water and just about an inch of water, so the bottom sitting in it, you can put it on your a windowsill above your not your your uh, sink, or you can put it in your fridge, and it will hold for quite a while. Hmm. Um, and so, 
So that kind of prolongs its. It'll prolong life. it, and then it's great because if especially and and you know what I'll do is if um even if I'm doing something as simple as like scrambled eggs in the morning, right? I'll I'll grab a little bit of rosemary or grab a little bit of herb, um, thyme, and just kind of peel it off the stem. Sometimes I don't even cut it up. I just pull a, you know pull it off the stem and throw it in mm. um, with a little bit of salt and pepper. I think you know you talked about salt. You know my. I guess really the big thing I try to chat with people. So when I do cooking classes, we do a whole, I have a whole kind of demonstration around the use of salt and butter. Mm -hmm. Salt specifically, I think is really misunderstood from a home cook's perspective. Um, I think because of um, heart disease and a lot of other issues, there's the, there's the concern of folks having to go on low salt diets. So salt in general has almost become kind of this evil thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that folks add salt to things because they want them to taste salty. Yeah. And what I try to share with folks is that salt, salt's the, the number one thing that salt does is when you add it to food is it, it really isn't designed to make things salty. If you've, if you've added it to something and it now tastes salty, you probably put too much salt in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, so I was explaining to people that salt is a, gr salt is one of the most widely used of all the spices with chefs because, Salt has the ability to make everything else in the dish elevate, the flavor profile of everything elevate. Um, and so when I do these cooking classes, I demonstrate this very, very simple roasted red pepper sauce. And what I do is I just take some roasted red peppers, we throw them in a, in a blender and blend them up into a puree and everyone tastes it. I'm like, okay, yeah, it tasted like roasted red peppers. Then I'll put it back on the on the blender and I'll add a little bit of salt to it and then they'll heighten it up and you'll get the smoky notes and a little bit of the acidic notes and things like that. You'll a lot of those little a lot of those smaller complex flavor profiles that are in a simple roasted red pepper will come out. And um, it's always a good demonstration to folks that like you saw I added salt, but it didn't make it salty. Right. It it elevated and brightened things. And so I always tell um, my friends and home cooks and folks that we're working with that if you're tasting something and it and it feels like it's just it's just missing. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just a little flat. Um, add a little bit of salt and see where you're at and kind of go from there. Um, there's a there's an acronym we use in cooking TSA taste, season, and adjust. And so, you know, you're always TSAing things. You're always tasting, seasoning, and adjusting as you go. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and when you look at the four, the, if you kind of, if you were to plot out the four flavor profiles, um, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, um, on, a, on a graph, there's actually ways that you can counterbalance things. So if something's a little acidic, you can add some sweetness to it and that'll kind of pull it back to the center. Mm -hmm. and so there's ways to kind of use those those different flavor profiles to balance things. And salt is one of the four corners of that. So Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you would say the rosemary, the thyme. Yeah, sorry, so we got salt. off track. No, no, there, no, yeah. it's good. Yeah, That's so ros rosemary and thyme are great. The reason I like those two is because... Um, I like basil, but basil is very finicky, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I had a herb garden, I felt like if I if I didn't cook that basil within a couple of days of pick, picking it, it kind of was starting to turn. So I like to have basil, but I typically won't buy it unless it's something I'm specifically going to be using in the next 24 to mm -hmm. 40 hours. Mm -hmm. I will say the the rule of thumb with all fresh herbs is store them in a little bit of water, right? Yeah, if you go if you go to like again Central Market, you'll notice that their fresh herbs are all sitting in little cups of water, and that's just for shelf life. They don't necessarily need to be refrigerated. Um, you know, if you think about it, is you know, if you put ro treat rosemary and, and most herbs like you would. Um, a bouquet of flowers, right? You don't put those in the refrigerator. You would right. let them sit on the table um, and put water in them. So I like rosemary. I like thyme because they they're they're pretty hardy. They're not very fragile. You can leave them out. You can you know you can buy a bunch and then just whenever you need them, just kind of pull it. And you could go through a, a bunch of them in a week. Mm -hmm. um, I like um, for me anytime I start cooking. Again, just going back to my French roots. Anytime I start cooking, is it always starts with garlic and rose and um, and onions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's some things like you know, I don't know, simple sloppy joes, right? Yeah. Or or um, uh, just a regular like meat sauce for pasta. If you're just starting out with, and I remember before I became a chef, I would cook, and I, I would you know when I when I would do either of those home recipes, it was like 
you know, first thing was hot pan, ground beef in it, mm-hmm. maybe some salt and pepper, and then throw a bunch of dried spices in, tomato sauce, and kind of go. Um, now I'll know to like build those flavors up. So, you know, have some of my aromatics, my mi- my mirepoix, so my onions and my garlic, and maybe a little celery. Because that stuff, when it wilts down, is it caramelizes. You know, onions when they caramelize, they they get they take on a different dynamic, a different flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, same with garlic, right? Garlic is really acidic and really bitter when it's raw, um, even spicy when it's raw. Yeah. But when it cooks down, it's you know, it's so delicious. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, gar- I love garlic. <laughs> garlic is like my spirit animal. So <laughs> I love garlic. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so that's so those are kind of always some tips and tricks that I give folks is that um, don't rely on dry spices. If you can do things fresh, always it's always going to be much better um, than dry. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also what I would also say too is I feel like a lot of home cooks um, kind of what we would call they over chef things. Mm -hmm. They throw too many things in there. Right. Sometimes a lot of times it's just about cooking technique. Right. Um, Being patient with, you know, again, getting back to like that pasta sauce, um, knowing that if you're going to do a pound of ground beef, um, maybe don't cook that entire pound of ground beef all at once, because when you throw that whole thing in there, you're going to crowd the pan, which Mm. then the meat's not the meat's not going to get brown it's really gonna steam and so you're losing a lot of flavor right um you know with meats is the way that you get the way you get flavor from protein uh from proteins is through a process called the maillard reaction and it's just the cauterizing of the protein cells on the outside of it right right so if you can imagine like you take a steak the best part of the steak really is the outer crust right Mm -hmm. um so if you were to take a steak and cut that all off it really wouldn't have much flavor so Mm -hmm. imagine that's kind of what you do when you take a whole pound of ground beef and you just throw it in a pan in a cold pan even and you overcrowd the pan and then and then it just kind of sits there and steams um, you're not getting any of that Maillard reaction because it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's yeah, where that, that flavor sense. comes from. So, you know, when you're looking at kind of building those types of things is salt and pepper are definitely needed because, uh, again, they're going to elevate everything, mm-hmm. right? And typically what I do is um, you want to taste, again, taste, season, and adjust as you go. So if you start out with kind of just some vegetables in your pan, Season them up a little bit, taste it, see if that's, you know, is everything kind of nice and lively in the pan? Because I've got bell peppers and I've got, you know, zucchini and I've got onions and garlic. Like it should taste really bright and like a garden. Um, And if not, maybe add a little salt to it. Kind of get those things, get some color on that. That's another thing I think a lot of home cooks don't realize is flavor comes from color, Mm -hmm. right? So the browning. Um, that's why steamed vegetables are kind of boring. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, ah, steamed vegetables, you know? Yeah. They definitely they, don't taste nearly they as. Don't, yeah. They don't, you know, a, a grilled, um, a grilled bell pepper and a steamed bell pepper, a grilled broccoli and, you know, mm-hmm. vastly different, right? Definitely. It's that, it's that, that browning is where all that flavor comes from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. So that's why you'll see chefs like deglaze the pan because all those little brown bits on the bottom of the pan, that's all flavor. They want to get that up and kind of figure out a way to incorporate that mm. back into the dish. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just to cook with wine. I mean, we like to cook with wine cause you know, I like <laughs> to cook with wine, right? But, but no, the deglazing with wine or something like that also, it, it has a purpose to pull those things off the bottom of the pan. God, as well. That makes yeah. sense. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that at all. Yeah. I always kind of wondered what the, what the purpose was. Well, it's so funny because there's so many things today that I see chefs do. And um, I mean, you know, we're all a bit of, you know, we're all we're all a bit of showmen. Right. Most chefs are showmen. Um, And so there's a lot of things we do. And there's probably a little more theatrics put into it than really needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think of the guy in the Internet, Salt Bay or whatever, when he's like, you know, off the elbow. That's always funny. But, you know, like, again, when I do cooking classes, I explain to folks that, you know, when you're seasoning something as simple as just seasoning something is that there's a really there's a distinct reason why chefs do it from up high. Um, And it's because and I say, you know, take, you know, get a pinch of salt and hold your hand about an inch off the table and then let go of the salt and it all falls in a pile versus do it yeah, versus do it six or eight inches off the there and it spreads out. Mm, And so but again, as chefs will, you know, we now (laughs) if six inches is great, doing it three feet off of the plate is even (laughs) better. Right. right? So, again, the theatrics there, it kind of cracks me up that we 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 make things a little more. Uh, theatrical and what they need to be and and yeah deglazing the pan with something and then let it flambeing up there is a purpose for lighting that stuff on fire so we're wanting to cook the the alcohol out of it Mm. right so if you're using like a port or a brandy and you really just want to extract the flavor but you don't want that that alcohol bite 
you got to burn that out. Oh, interesting. So there, okay. there's, again, there's a reason behind that. But still, it's fire and it looks cool. It right? does look cool, yeah. <laughs> so, so there, it's, it's, you know, that's kind of the, that's, I think, part of the allure to being a chef is the cool things we get to do yeah, with fire and definitely. knives and all that fun stuff. So that's, yeah, that's interesting. That makes total sense, though, mm-hmm. about the fire thing. Yeah. I always thought it was just for show. But I yeah. Guess. That's cool. Well, you know, I mean, a very like so a good example is a very, very traditional dish of like bananas foster. Right. Mm -hmm. So usually bananas foster is really simply this. It's just some bananas in a pan with like some sugar, some butter, some vanilla and some booze, Mm -hmm. whether it be rum or bourbon or whatever it may be, brandy. And then you're just kind of cooking it all down. So it creates a sauce and then you light it on fire just to burn the alcohol off because, you know. Please don't give my four year old, you yeah, know, yeah. A, a bourbon, a bourbon banana. Right. 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 <laughs> we want to burn the alcohol. But yeah, that's, you know, that again, that's kind of the way that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. And so another thing, actually, that kind of made me think of um, when people are cooking and all that is when they're using different oils, um, mm-hmm. oils versus, you know, when you oil a pan, yeah. or butter pan, all these yeah. things. I feel like, no, I it took me a lot of different reading and stuff to kind of more understand sure. when to use certain oils. Um, but I think a lot of people don't because using certain oils in certain dishes or for certain things yes. does make a big difference. I right? agree. Yeah. Yeah. So depending upon the technique that you're using, the cooking technique that you're using definitely drives what you're wanting to, what you should use. Um, you know, in my, in my kitchen, in my house is, um, we pretty much, I pretty much have either a really good olive oil or an avocado oil. Mm-hmm. Um, avocado oil is really good because it's very healthy, but also it has a very, very high smoke point. Yeah. So if I'm, you know, if I'm going to sear off, um, a piece of chicken before I put it in the oven, um, and I need that pan to be really, really, really hot, I'll use a bit of av- avocado oil. Because it'll allow that pan to get hotter, right? Um, when you're cooking with oil in a pan, there the, the oil kind of serves a couple of different purposes. Um, is oil in the pan is gonna it's gonna impart a little bit of flavor, um, but really oil in a pan. A lot of people think that it's used to kind of lubricate the pan to keep things moving. And while it does, what oil does even more is it kind of creates um, an environment where there's a really efficient transference of heat from the pan to whatever it is you're cooking, right? And so I always try to give the example as if I'm going to cook my hand, if my hand's a piece of chicken, and I put it in a pan, and there's just a dry pan, it's easy to understand that there's going to be microscopic air pockets Mm -hmm. in between my hand and that pan, right? Well, we know that air um, is a horrible transference of heat, Mm -hmm. right? It's just inefficient. So when you when you do when you're searing or cooking a piece of chicken in a dry pan is now what's happening is it's not going to get a good sear. It's not going to cook evenly. Um, It's you're not going to get you know, we talked earlier about the Maillard reaction, that that browning. You're not going to get that browning. So it's just not going to taste as good. Interesting. Right. If you add a little bit of oil to it, what it does is it's going to fill in all those pockets of air. And now it's going to be one seamless just ability for that pan to transfer all that heat up into that chicken and so you'll get a much more even cook you'll get a much better crust Mm -hmm. that my art reaction will be a lot crustier so you'll get a lot more flavor um and so that's why you see a lot of chefs cook with oil and the reality of it is is a lot of folks think well it's 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 unhealthy and i would argue that number one is that if there's a quarter if there's a tablespoon of oil in the pan when we pick that piece of item out of the pan there's probably still three quarters of a quarter of that tablespoon of oil yeah. still in the pan. And um, most things is that even with like frying items, if you're frying something, it's not as unhealthy as I think a lot of folks would think. Because if you're doing it the right way, as soon as that item hits the oil, it almost in completely encases itself. Mm-hmm. And so the only way that things get really oily and soggy is if they're not being fried at a high enough temperature okay. where that thing goes in and the oil is not hot enough. So now the oil, instead of, instead of just kind of immediately creating this cocoon around whatever it is you're cooking and kind of get it nice and crispy mm-hmm. on the outside. And then the, the item itself is transferring heat into the middle to create the, the kind of do that thermal dynamics to cook it. Um, the oil kind of seeps in. Uh, okay. And so eventually it'll get cooked on the outside, but that's when, you know, I get I have I have the idea in my mind of like um, a crab cake, right? Mm-hmm. The difference between a crab cake that you threw in a fry in a, in a fryer that was really hot, you'll we'll bring it out and you can open it up, 
and it'll still be nice and lush and fluffy in the middle with the crab versus one that was that you put in the fryer wasn't hot enough and you open it up and now it's going to be kind of watery and oily on the yeah. inside. So that's kind of, you know, the, some things around oil, I, I, that's kind of my thoughts around it. Um, I know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of con- concern and research around getting really good, um, um, quality olive oils. And I know that that's something you got to be careful of getting rancid oils. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think for me is that we just, I try to, I try to, I try to buy like a good organic olive oil. Um, actually Costco carries one that we use and I go through it enough that, you know, in our household that we use it enough that it yeah. doesn't sit too long. Cause that's the other item. That's the other part of it too, is if you buy a big jug of it and it sits on your shelf for a year and a half, it can kind of turn. Oh, okay. But, um, so there's some things to be mindful there of mm-hmm. oil. Um, you know, in the culinary world, most chefs and most restaurants obviously are moving away from things like peanut oil yeah. because of the allergies there. Um, but peanut oil is a good idea if it's a good oil, um, for, uh, some environments for some cooking. Cause again, it has a good smoke point. Um, in my kitchen, we use a lot of rendered animal fats, actually. Okay. So we got a lot of really good quality beef from 44 Farms and some other local farmers here. And we'll take all that trim and we'll render all the fat out of it because that that's really good healthy fats in there. Um, and um, um, that has an even higher smoke point than a lot of other items. And so, again, is when we're getting into kind of techniques of cooking and things like that is the higher the smoke point, you know, when you're cooking it with a pan and oil, the, the lower common denominator between the two of them is the oil. The oil is going to have a lower smoke point than the pan ever will. Mm-hmm. Pan will get 800 degrees. If you sit, if you leave it there long enough, the oil is only going to get about, you know, 375 to 400. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're kind of limited to how hot that oil will get before it just starts to deteriorate and won't do its job. Right. Yeah. And you don't, you don't want the oils to be smoking, right? Like, so yeah, the rule of thumb is that when you're cooking, you'll see the oil kind of give that first little puff of smoke. And once you see that puff of smoke, you've kind of reached the apex of however hot that oil is going to get. And from that point, if you start, if you don't start using it, the oil will start cooking. And I mean, I, Every chef, every cook has done it where they left a pan on the on the stove, even home cooks. Leave a pan on the stove with a burner on the oil and you leave it too long and you can tell that it's just kind of started turning brown. Yeah. Even cooking, you start cooking oil. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that you gotta you gotta watch that. Yeah, yeah, because that is something that I know it's happened to me many times. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, you're busy in the kitchen and I'm trying to do too many things at once. I've got too many things going and I'll put a pan on, or I'll start it up to get it hot and I'll walk away. And you know, a minute later, someone will be like, Hey Mike, you know, you're cooking pans again. Right. <laughs> so as you walk in there and there's just a pan that's just smoldering hot and I've burned off all the oil. So you got to cool it down, scrub it out, start over. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's just part of the job. Comes yeah. With it. Just got to pay close attention. <laughs> um, and so g- going on to like, I know you were talking about earlier, like the importance of eating seasonally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think I, that's something I hear a lot about and I'm sure other people do too. Um, but it's something kind of, it feels a little bit daunting to kind of think about eating seasonally just from afar, like thinking sure. eating seasonally, like now I sure. actually have to pick and choose foods even though they're all there. Yeah. What are like, do you have any kind of tips or advice in terms of like what even do you have any is there like a general rule of thumb when it comes to eating the season like what is like a summer food versus yeah, a winter so food Yeah so it's well it's so I have a lot to say around seasonality and eating seasonality there's so many different avenues we could go down with this but um the to answer your question is living in Texas it's very difficult to eat seasonally in the summer mm-hmm. unless you like watermelon okra and corn, mm-hmm. you know, because that's pretty much all we have growing out here and, and tomatoes and chilies. Right. Um, so, you know, whereas I, you know, one of the chefs that works for me, she's from California and she said, you know, she told me the other day, she's like, it's so difficult for me to adjust because in California we can get everything locally year round because the temperature, the climate where she was is just great. They, right. you know, they could, they could pretty much grow anything year round. So, um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> I still have to refer back to there's a lot of guides that you can find online and things like that as far as what's in season locally. Yeah. Um, You know, a good way, a good rule of thumb, too, is if you um, is visiting a lot of the websites of the local 
kind of urban farms mm-hmm. um, just to see what they have available. Cause that'll tell you what's season seasonal locally. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole concept of seasonal is um, it kind of depends on where you go with it um, because theoretically, you know, um, squash is seasonal somewhere, right? right you know, right. pumpkins are being grown somewhere right now. Right. right. Um, I think for me is that with seasonality and what, what I find important about seasonality is really, really kind of when you step back and you look at the idea of eating seasonally, um, is the health Im- impacts that it has not only on us, on you and your body, but really kind of even on, on the, on the, on the earth. Right. right. And so, um, there's a lot of, there's a few chefs here in town that are, that are hyper, hyper disciplined on this. Um, you know, um, chef Jesse Griffith or Daidue, if onions aren't in season within like a hundred miles radius of Austin, he's, his restaurant doesn't have onions in their wow. food. Even more is that if he, if the, lemons, you know, he gets all of his lemons from South Texas. If lemons aren't in season, you're not getting lemons with your iced tea. Wow. Now, how how unsouthern is that, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine going into a restaurant in, in the in South in South US and asking for iced tea and not getting a lemon? That sounds like it? a Texas sin. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, so you know, and and the reason behind all of that, the reason that eating seasonally is important is that a couple of things from from just a health standpoint on on you personally is. Um, and, and these are, you know, if you think about it is, um, if you're eating things that are at the peak of their season, then the nutritional value that they have is kind of at its peak. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so there's, so not only, so, and at the end of the day is we all eat for a number of reasons, but we really need it for fuel. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have to keep, take that into place. So the nutritional value is kind of, you're maximizing that piece of it. Um, what I would also argue too, is that from a flavor standpoint is that, um, you know, eating something at the peak of its freshness obviously is going to have its most impact, all the sugars and every starches or whatever those components are in that, uh, fruit or vegetable, um, will have reached their apex. Mm -hmm. And so you're really going to get that true, um, flavor, what that, you know, that, what that item was supposed to be, was supposed to taste like. Um, so, you know, from those components, from just a sheer kind of culinary perspective, um, I would say that those are, um, that those, those are some good things to keep in mind. Uh, when you step back a little bit more and you think about, um, you know, chefs, we have to be conservators of our environment. We have to, you know, kind of be, um, stewards of our community because we're taking something from the wild and we're giving it to our, to our community. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to strike that balance. And, 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 in many ways, I find responsibility in managing both, you know, being a conservative of conservator of the earth, because that's where we're getting everything from, but also being um, a steward of my community and being a leader in, in, in that regard. And so, um, you know, uh, when being able to buy as locally, being able to buy seasonally means you're able to buy locally, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if I want zucchini right now, I can go to a handful of urban farms. I can go to a handful of, I mean, there's zucchini coming out, coming out our ears right now in <laughs> Texas, right? Zucchini and okra and things like that, right? Um, and so um, you can definitely, th- there's, so you don't have to go so far, right? And so that item can be picked at a little bit more of its freshness. So it, mm-hmm. could, it could ripen on the vine a little bit more. It doesn't have as much of a carbon footprint to get to where you need it to be. And then you have all those natural, you have all of the, the nutritional things. You know, one other thing, one other thing I, I meant to mention, there's a, lot of argue, there's a lot of folks out there that also think that, um, that the symbiosis of our body and, and, and the seasons is that if you notice is that many of the things that we would eat in certain times of the year have vitamins that we would need. So Mm -hmm. for example, in the winter, you get a lot of vitamin D from a lot of the vegetables and things you would get in the winter because Uh. the sun's usually, you're not out in the sun. Right. 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 So, and and so when you look at kind of the different vitamins and things that you're going to naturally get from a seasonal item, it's usually something that you're going to be lacking that you will have lacked or will have needed an abundance of because of that time of year as well. Yeah. That's so there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks that kind of, that really have that mindset of, you know, if I eat seasonally, I know that I'm kind of following that same thing. Um, you know, if you think about the fall and the winter, there's a lot of pumpkins and squashes and things like a lot of, a lot of potatoes, right? Yeah. Starchy items. Well, 
you know, not that we're bears and we're hibernating for the winter, but, you know, as humans, we're probably going to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more, um, naturally, if we think about, you know, a long time ago, we're probably going to be a little bit more lethargic in the summer or in the winter. Yeah. And so we need kind of the, that fuel. Right? right. That makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of, like, like I said, there's a lot of different little rabbit holes you can go down with seasonality. You can talk about things about, you know, even when it comes to things like farm to plate, you know, mm. farm to farm to table. Um, there's a lot of value there as well. And I think that all kind of plays into that whole conversation of seasonality. Um, and, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing a lot more chefs these days, I think kind of take that mindset that I was talking about of, you know, I, I'm not just a cook, right? I'm not, I'm, I, I'm, I can be more than just the guy that, you know, sling steaks on a Friday night that mm -hmm. I can make more of an impact by the, by where I source things from, how I cook things and then what, and then what that looks like and what I present and offer up to my guests and to, you know, my friends and my family. Yeah. Yeah. And even beyond that is just everybody in how they cook at home yeah. can, can, and really probably should think of it in a similar way sure. in that what you're buying isn't just yeah. like, because that's another thing about supermarkets, I think, yeah. is that it, it's it really kind of disconnects you from absolutely where how the food was actually brought to you because mm -hmm. it's just there. Like you don't have to think about anything that mm -hmm. went into it. But if you actually really think about it, and you're thinking about where your dollars are going, yeah. how that vegetable or how that animal was raised, what went into getting it to where you are, all yeah. these different components, yeah, you you are kind of it, it, you're investing your money into the practices that whatever food you're buying uses so if you're able to use your money and give it if you are able to you know from local farmers yeah. or from these different you're not only going to be getting a higher quality product more than likely yeah um you're also helping support these local farmers yeah. local communities that that you know they rely on that kind sure. of support sure. so it's kind of like a beyond food kind of I agree. stance to take which yeah. is kind of cool that a lot of people definitely yeah. don't think about yeah. well and it's interesting you know for me is my my progression of my evolution through my career and being a chef is that i'm finding myself these last couple of years being more drawn to getting into hunting to mm. really under and and really um from just kind of a self-reliant standpoint of i want to know i want to be more involved in where the food that my family eats comes from yeah and so that's always that's something that i've kind of just begun to scratch the surface on and learn more about and um, so that's, you, you mentioned like kind of knowing where our food comes from. I think that's really important. Um, I'm not saying everyone needs to go out and, you know, live in a cave and, you know, and go yeah, back to yeah. paleolithic times, <laughs> right, and, right. you know, hunt all of our food. I, that's, that's not, but I think that it's it, like you say, I think the more we, the more, the more you can take and invest in knowing and being mindful of where things are coming from. It's, it, there's, there's no downside to that. Yeah. Um, you know, you had mentioned earlier, um, wanting uh, tips and tricks on folks wanting to know or being able to figure out in a grocery store what things are seasonal. You know, a great tool that's available to most folks in big cities, I know there's a handful of them here in Austin, is doing like different CSA boxes. Hmm. You know, Johnson's Backyard does one. Uh, I think Farmhouse does one. And so, you know, what better way to just have a box of fresh grocery, of fresh vegetables show up at your house? You know those are seasonal, right? Because they were probably, you know, like with Johnson's Backyard, that stuff was grown just on the out on the outskirts oh, of Austin. So it's like, right? is that like a that's like a local farm that basically does? Yeah. They, they so ship CSA to you? stands for like uh, community. I I don't I can't remember. You guys can Google it, but yeah. <laughs> um, but essentially, what it is is it's like a membership, and okay. so Johnson's Backyard is a pretty pretty well known kind of. Uh, I don't want to say urban farm, but kind of local farm here in Austin, right? Okay. They're at all the farmers markets. They're even in Whole Foods and stuff like that. But they're very they're they're known for being having uh, kind of organic and sustainable practices. Um, but what they do is is that you can pay a monthly fee, and every week or they have a variety of different uh, interims in, intervals that you can receive these boxes. And essentially it's just a box of vegetables okay. and it's a, it's whatever they have, whatever they're, they're harvesting from the farm at that time. And so, and it's always a great mixture of, you know, 15 to 20 different things, um, that they're, that they've got going. And so, you know, certain times of the year, you're going to get things like, like right now it's probably, uh, you know, peppers and eggplant and okra and, carrots and beets and things like that. Um, other times of the year, it's just, you know, it's going to be their squashes and things like that. So that's always something because 
um, sometimes that kind of takes a little bit of the thought out of it. Yeah. Where if every week your CSA box shows up, you can just open it up and go, okay, I have eggplant and I have okra and I have tomatoes. What do I do with that? And that can get you going down that road of kind of planning out your meals for the week. Yeah. Right? yeah. You know, sometimes, sometimes I think with home and even chefs, like I, I have a hard time. Sometimes what I'll do if I'm kind of stuck and having a creative kind of lull is I'll just start cruising the websites of a lot of the local farms here and just see like, what are they, what are they harvesting right now? What's in season? And kind of just use those raw ingredients to start, um, you know, I'll take it you know, for example, eggplant. Okay. I have eggplant. Now, how do I want to cook it? Right. I'll come up with that. And then, okay, well, what, how do I want, like what flavor profile do I want it to be an Asian eggplant or do I want it to be French or Italian? And then from that point, you, you kind of just build that little, those little thought bubbles and kind of walk through that brain mapping. Mm -hmm. And you can, before you know it, you'll have a whole dish mapped out for that. Um, and so sometimes maybe just those CSA boxes is a good kind of spark for yeah. a lot of home cooks to um to kind of get those ideas flowing yeah that's cool actually i had i didn't even know about those so yeah. that's, that's really cool i love you're here in austin i love johnson's backyard they're great because they'll either deliver them directly to your door or you can go to like a local farmer's market and pick them up nice. um, a little pro tip i always recommend go to the farmer's market because they'll let you kind of open the box right there and if there's something that you don't really care for a lot of times they'll let you swap oh, it out nice. that's so cool. like for me i like eggplant but um, this time of year, you're getting a lot of eggplant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I would do is I'd probably swap a couple of those out for something else, you know, and they're real, they're really cool. As long as it's kind of an even trade, yeah. don't worry. Um, so yeah, that's always a good tip. Again, when I had more time to cook for my family, that was definitely one of the things that we did. Yeah. Um, these days is, um, you know, I, I'm, we're still ordering a lot of stuff from a lot of the local farms, but it's on a little bit of larger scale yeah. for the, yeah. for the company. So, right. Yeah. And then so so for people when they're when they're, you know, trying to get into this whole cooking thing, yeah. trying to trying to get a hang of it. Yeah. Um, obviously, especially now with Pinterest and yeah. all these like there's so many different recipes. There are. There are. Um, do you have any I mean, I don't know. Is there any advice that you could use? Because I feel like it, for people that are just starting, it's it's tough to just start cooking from scratch because yeah. you'd have no idea. I agree. So using either free online sources because there's blogs sure. like there's so many things like that that you can start just kind of um, messing with just uh -huh. experimenting or even just buying maybe some cookbooks yep. that because I, I actually have a few cookbooks that i love to sure. use and then after a while when you're following different recipes you really do start to like you start to understand like yeah. oh this is how this is going to taste and you start seeing these different like spices that are always popping up and you start yeah. to kind of know and then you can kind of start doing your own spins off of those recipes you don't have to rely on them as much but i feel like it's maybe a good platform to start with yeah i i agree so you know when i talk to when i talk to folks you know when i get that question from folks um a lot of times what i'll what i like to try and understand is what's their what's their comfort level in cooking right that that's always a good place to start um, if they, you know, if I get the kind of the deer and headlights look like, well, you know, I can definitely slam out some Kraft mac and cheese in the box. <laughs> right. But that's kind of where it ends. So, you know, the, if that's kind of, if that's kind of, if, if, if we're talking to someone who's just really kind of uncomfortable, which in, the, in many instances, that's what's happening. Right. Cause I feel like you kind of have two different segments of people. You have folks that, the 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 thought of going in and cooking is just overwhelming because mm -hmm. it's just kind of paralysis by analysis. Where do I start? Holy, holy crap. What, you know, what, how do I do this? Um, I always, I always start with those folks and I look at them and I say, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's nothing better than just some oven roasted vegetables with salt and pepper and some fresh herbs, you know, take a, take a zucchini, cut it however way you want it. Do it in wedges, do it in rings, whatever, just cut it in cubes and then toss it in a bowl with some oil, salt and pepper and some fresh thyme or fresh rosemary, and then put it in the oven, lay it out on a sheet pan, put it in the oven. It's super simple. Um, and then just let it cook mm -hmm. and, and just try from there. Right. Um, you got to kind of no pun intended, but you have to eat that elephant one bite at a time. Right. Yeah. Um, I do like cookbooks. Yeah. Um, I, we, um, I, I kind of collect cookbooks, if you will, yeah. which is probably, I'm sure many chefs do. 
I, I look at them. I, I have a variety of different things that I like to read in the far as cookbooks. Uh, I think that one that I feel like is, so there's one book that I use that is almost like, um, almost like an encyclopedia versus a cookbook. And it's called the flavor Bible. Mm. And I like that because you can look up any ingredient that you can ever think of and it'll have it in there. And then it'll have a list of things that go well with it, that it pairs well with. And so you can look up anything from duck to parsley, to cumin, to curry, to lamb, and it'll have a long list of things. And so, um, so when you, you know, kind of like when you're building a, a, a model, right? If you have all the pieces, it's just a matter of kind of how do you put them together at mm-hmm. that point. And that's, I think, the biggest part. Yeah. The biggest challenge is that folks, you know, for a lot of folks that are a little bit more comfortable with cooking is it's they, they, they're tired of building the same model every time. You're like, you know, I, I have my three go-tos that I'm comfortable cooking. I just don't have a lot of, a lot of creativity around it or even a lot of inspiration. Um, and so... So yeah, that's always good, right? Um, to to kind of just find use that book and kind of come up with some different components that you can put together. Yeah, um, that's always a good start for that. I I think that so there's a there's a term in in the culinary world mise en place, and it's a French term that means everything in its place. But in the culinary world, what that really means is that just the hypersensitivity to organization. And I bring that up because so many times um, a lot of folks, I get the question of, um, you know, I don't want to hire you, but I really want to, or I've had, you know, I've had folks that are like, well, I'd really like to hire you, but I want to try and take this on myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Or how do I, how do I manage this, this behemoth of kind of eating right and kind of not falling into the traps of hitting the drive through on my way home Yeah. or you know, I know I can't tell me how many folks I get. The, you were talking about going to the grocery store, grocery store or hungry. I can't tell you how many clients or how many folks I talk to where they go to the grocery store on Sunday with with all good intentions and they buy a ton of fresh groceries. By Wednesday, they're dialing Domino's, mm-hmm. you know, because because as the day comes on, they, they just kind of hit a wall. And um, if you kind of follow that moniker of, of mise en place and everything it's place and you get organized on the weekend, that's where I think you're going to find a lot of success. Um, I can tell you, I'll give you a prime example. On my way over here, I ran through Costco and did a full shop in about 22 minutes. That's good. It's because I was organized, right? Yeah. I and, and so I organize my, and, and so everything I do is organized because I go shopping a lot. That's one piece that a lot of folks get really frustrated about mm-hmm. um, is shopping. And so one thing you can do when you're shopping is stay organized and write a list. And don't just write a haphazard list. I actually segment out my list on meats, dairy, dry goods, and then produce. Because mm-hmm. then I'll have a whole list of my produce and I, just, I don't have to kind of hunt and peck through right. my list because when I used to do those lists, there was always something I forgot. Um, and then I kind of, again, since I'm mostly shopping on the outside, most most grocery stores you walk into, the produce section is kind of front and center along one wall or something mm-hmm. like that. And then I just kind of work my way around. Yeah. Um, so that's I think that's really good kind of staying focused there. But with meal planning is um, don't get too overwhelmed on trying to make these super elaborate meals. Um, keep things simple. Um, things like roasted nuts on can chain can be a game changer on a dish. Throwing a little cheese on something can be a game changer for a dish. Um, looking for little sauces here and there that you can make that, you know, that roasted red pepper sauce that we do is so easy. It's literally just, you know, roasted red bell peppers and then you puree them, throw a little salt, a little bit of butter and you're done. And it's such a versatile salt, versatile sauce. So, you know, I would recommend for folks that kind of feel overwhelmed by that is maybe find a couple of little things they like, but try and throw it in in a couple different environments as yeah. well. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. Yeah, especially with the sauce, because I feel like a lot of sauces, people don't I definitely don't think about making no. them themselves. Normally, you're all. just looking at the yeah. store. But there's tons of really one super, super easy mm-hmm. sauce recipes because oh, you're just blending some stuff. Yeah. Like it's really easy. Yeah. They're really good and they can totally. Yeah, they. I mean, it could take like if you have like a chicken and what mm-hmm. like some kind of dish and you could use three or four different sauces that'll totally change the dish and make it a for little sure. bit more exciting yeah for sure i you know i tell you um 
when I was training for a uh, an obstacle course race in the spring, I was on a pretty I was on a pretty strict diet. Just I had a plan um, that I was working with a trainer on, and it was a lot of you know ground turkey mm-hmm. and broccoli and bro- you know and so and there and I, I went to her one day and I said I. I need to sauce this up, right? I mean, I, I'm I, I'm in that mindset. I know we're we're training to fuel the body, right? We're just eating to fuel the body, but I'm a chef and you know, I, I got it, I got I get bored. And so what I did was I actually just came up, I didn't come up with it, but I actually started making like a fresh chimichurri sauce. Mm. Because all it is is just fresh herbs, a little bit of red wine vinegar, some oil, and maybe like and a little bit of um, garlic. So it's all it is. It's just herbs and oil and a little bit of vinegar. And you could throw that on. And it was it's kind of like a pesto in the sense that it kind of goes on pretty much anything. Mm. Pesto is another one, too. Yeah, right. I love you can pesto. make that. And I mean, you can put pesto on your eggs in the morning. You could put pesto on um, a chicken, a grilled chicken salad at lunch. Yeah. A you sandwich. Can put, you can put it on a sandwich. You can put it on um, a dinner. If you do like spaghetti, uh, spaghetti squash instead of pasta, mm-hmm. you put that on there. You'll never know the difference. Yeah. You know, I little like sauces pesto. like that are definitely game changers. And if you can figure out a couple of those, you can definitely make those um, like make them ahead on a Sunday. And that type of stuff will hold for a couple weeks. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, Technically, according to the health department, it'll hold for five days. <laughs> we got to play it. But, but no, I mean, honestly, like if you, you know, the only thing that's going to happen with that chimichurri is that the herbs are going to start turning a little brown from the, are going to start oxidizing a little bit from the acid of mm-hmm. the vinegar and that, but otherwise that sauce is fantastic. Yeah. So. Yeah, because that, that is like a huge way for people to kind of spice their stuff up. And it really is easy. Like it's not it that is, much work. It is. And, and granted, you know, you're going to, you're at one, you know, you, if, if chimichurri is your go-to every week, you're going to get tired of it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my recommendation is kind of, you know, get three or four that you could kind of rotate in. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, I, you know, that kind of stuff. And again, you know, getting back to your earlier thing of, about what some tips to kind of liven that stuff up, I always go back to the easiest thing is just add some fresh herbs, you mm-hmm. know, parsley, cilantro, thyme rosemary those four right there are fantastic i love basil as well but like i said it just it's a little finicky if you get it you got to know you just got to use it soon yeah um sage is a great one as well i really like i'm really i've kind of had this asian food kick lately i've been trying to do a lot of a we're fermenting some chilies at the kitchen right now we're doing all kind of cool stuff but um so like thai basil which has a different flavor profile than traditional like italian basil I'm really digging that as well. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool. That's a fun thing to do too, is kind of mess with different, like you said, different flavor profiles yeah. and kind of have different yeah, absolutely. themes going on, yeah. which is and kind of cool. Yeah. You can definitely go down the rabbit hole on the internet though. If you just start searching, I mean, you know, you want to, you, you want to get sucked into a, another dimension, Google, like, you know, uh, healthiest lunch ideas and you know, you'll, you'll be stuck for days. Yeah. On, there's, on different, millions. there's millions of them. Yeah. I, I think a lot of those too, is that I would caution folks on, um, like I said before, is keep it simple. The more you chef it up mm-hmm. on the things, the more you kind of try to make zucchini more than what it is, you almost kind of move away from it. And um, you'll, I think what you'll find is that kind of the diminishing returns of the amount of effort you put in versus starkly different impact it's going to make, right? It's yeah. Like you're you're, you're going to probably lose a little bit of that there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and then so, so I know obviously... I did want to kind of ask you just a little bit about mm-hmm. your your business as well because what you guys do is your so it's called the Austin Artisan yeah and so you basically from what I gathered you kind of help people obviously you do like small events and you uh-huh. do catering for that but then you also do almost like meal prepping for people yeah. like week to week yeah. basis yeah so so really to step back I mean what we do is food. But what I would say is that really the bigger the bigger mission or the bigger brand behind what we do is really trying to bring an is bring bring back an experience with everything, and so um, you know with our dinner parties that's definitely um, very much of kind of market you know folks hire us to have a really high end private chef experience mm-hmm. when they're celebrating a special occasion, right? Okay. We do a ton of bachelorette parties. We'll do anniversaries, birthdays, right? Any occasion where they, where folks want just, you know, an intimate dinner for, you know, 12, 14 of their friends, they want a chef to come in and they want that really cool experience. But the experience also translates over into our weekly meals because like I said, is that, um, and I sympathize with this is that 
our families are yearning for that experience to come back together. And so while what I do with my weekly meals is we're, our food isn't the experience, but it's creating and giving those families the, the ability to go back to have that experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And so, yeah, the weekly meals are great. And everything we do, again, everything we do on both sides of that fence of, of the two different services is very much about a customized and personalized approach. Um, we're not really a one size fits all type company. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that a lot of folks call us and just realize we're not a good fit for what they're looking for. Um, but with our weekly meals is where, where we really, the value that we really offer to a lot of our clients is there's not really a meal service out there that really offers you the ability to customize. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, most of our families are like mom and dad both work and they have picky eating kids. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to get fresh, you know, they're, they're, they're balancing and juggling that guilt, that parental guilt of, and, and pressure of trying to be good parents and teaching their kid, their kids, good eating habits and feeding them good, you know, um, feeding them good, wholesome food. Um, but still trying to balance just the crazy chaos of, of life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and when you have, and again, like I said, I have a four year old and she has her moments. Um, but when you're, when you're a parent and you have kids and they just aren't always getting in line with what, you know, they're not always on the pro and the program being able to have someone like us that can kind of, that can pivot and adjust and, you know, um, you know, Little Joe, he may he may be all into cauliflower this week, but then if we put it on the on the menu next week, you know all bets are off. He won't do it. So we can kind of pivot and customize specifically to each client, um, which is again is something very unique. Most of the personal chefs in Austin, most of the kind of weekly meal services, they try to take a little bit more of a, a one size fits all. So you yeah. know, if if the fish if the dish is salmon rice and broccoli and you don't like the rice or the broccoli well just don't order the dish right whereas right. we're like okay cool what do you want you want uh you know you want to do um pot noodles instead of the rice you want to do bros- brussels sprouts instead of the broccoli cool let's swap it all swap it all out or whatever nice. so that's yeah. awesome yeah yeah it's it's a lot of fun um it's it, it like i said is i really feel like with what we do is is really kind of being able to customize that. And, and it's fun because I, I get to know my clients a lot more. I don't have to create this one size fits all and manage a client list of 50 or 60 people. I mean, we cook for like 14, 15 families in a week, which may sound like a lot. But um, when you kind of look at us compared to a lot of the other companies in town, we're, you know, they're like, oh, 15 families, like that's nothing, you know? Right, yeah. right. But it's a lot to us because we're cooking 15 individual right, it's meal services. It's all very customized. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, that's a, like such a cool option for people to be able to utilize and really yeah. kind of, like you said, get them back to still having those good oh, yeah. meals despite, you know, both parents super busy working sure. and all that. So that's really cool. Yeah. You know, there's something, there's something to be said for the value and the peace of mind of knowing that when you go into your fridge every day and you pull out that food that you know, that the people that cooked it, um, that everything was done with a, a set of standards that, that you, that you, that are, you share synergy with. Um, and also that everything's done and tailored and specifically in a way that specifically for you and your family, you know, we have them, you know, all of our clients before they start, they have to fill out this food profile, which is kind of this big survey of what they like, what they don't like, how they like things cooked. Um, And so when we custom write their menus every week, they get a chance to look at it and review it and make any edits or changes. You know, some of these big services is you just get an email, like the day your, your service is shipped. And it's like, here's what's coming to you. And you think, well, Gosh, I really wasn't in the mood for green beans this week, but I guess I'm I guess I am now, right? <laughs> yeah. Um so so yeah, none of our clients are really beholden to what we are in the mood to cook that week. We always we always custom tailor it to them. And so it you know, they're like I said, there's the peace of mind of knowing that that's taken care of and when you guys sit down, you can just focus on being a family and and enjoying those moments because uh we all know that <laughs> the TV and the electronics and stuff are all crying out for all of us to get back to. And so you can kind of have that moment of solitude, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an yeah. awesome experience to yeah. get to have. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, Mike. for sure. I, mean, I really appreciate it. It's really cool getting to talk to a chef, a chef and kind of get that perspective on the yeah. whole food thing. And I think it is going to be really helpful for people that are trying to 
one, not get so bored with their cooking at home. Yeah. And then also just understanding a lot of these different things we're talking about, about, you know, eating seasonally, some of the better yeah. herbs to have around yeah, the house and sure. things like that too. So I really appreciate you coming yeah, on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, again, like I say, is that I'm a, I'm a parent and I'm a business owner and I'm busy, you know, just like everyone else. And so, um, my heart goes out to the parents <laughs> out there that are just kind of, you know, dealing with that parental guilt of, you know, cause this it is, the, this is the time of year, right? It's back to school. Yeah. So whatever, all the families are trying to get back get moms and dads are trying to get the families back into into a routine um and so yeah it's you know don't overthink things too much keep things simple um, um try and find ways to kind of ex make things efficient right those are all little tips and tricks along the way that we as chefs apply to everything we do every day. You know, um, if we can find a way to shave 15 seconds off of doing something, well, if we're doing that same thing a hundred times in a day, you know, think about how many seconds, how many minutes we could save. And so that's what I always tell folks too, is just look at what you're doing and, and try and be efficient about it and don't overthink it, you know, and mm -hmm. give yourself some grace because we're all, <laughs> we're all human. And, and, and yeah, you know, even, even my family eats, you know, uh, take out pizza every right once in a while, yeah don't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly, exactly yeah um and so do you have like a website or anything for i do i do so the name of the company is the austin artisan and our website is uh the austin awesome so yeah come check us out yeah definitely go check um, them out. also check us out on instagram um we're at the austin artisan also on facebook um one thing I'll tell you, one thing I like to, I'm very proud of is one thing you'll find on our website is that all the food and all the pictures of food on everything is stuff that we've done. So there's some gorgeous plates out there, some stuff we're pretty proud of. Awesome. Um, and so no, none of that stuff, stock images, no, stock, were, images. no stock images. We, we did all that stuff ourselves. Awesome. So, so yeah, That's absolutely. Good to see. Yeah, all man. right. Well, yeah, thank you again. And, um, hopefully maybe we can get you back on sometime. Absolutely. Really Let's do it again. It. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. All right. Thanks. thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Take it easy. We're the only country in the world that separates the mind from the body. Yeah. The only country. I'm joined today by Athena Jezik, Ed Norton, Robert Gardner, Dr. Paula Bruno. The body has a natural ability and tendency to want to heal. It doesn't have to be complicated or costly. I can talk science. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk science for sure. We do often need to supplement with magnesium. Unbalanced life. Mm. Mm. Vitally important to make sure that the entire system is opened up. Actually, happiness and suffering are states of mind. They're not external things. Do you have any recommendations <laughs> for our listeners? Do you use a tennis ball? Yoga. Try a HIIT workout. You only got to do 20 minutes. Every day, having a practice for yourself. We're not powerless. Right. To improve our situation. Welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast.